Um, all of our family lives outside of Texas. We're the only ones that live here. And so when I and, and my family go on trips, we try to go see them. And we were so fortunate to use our Delta Sky Miles companion ticket. I'm hoping that if I say that, they're gonna like give me something for advertising for them. Um, we used our companion tickets to go to Montana over Thanksgiving break. And Charlie posted a few pictures and one of my friends said, I saw, your, I saw Charlie's pictures, it looks so fantastic. I hope it wasn't just Insta-fantastic. And I love that. I loved that, that this friend knows our family and that even if you put three teenage boys smiling with a beautiful backdrop, one picture does not a happy vacation make. <laughs> and, and I started to think about how we do that though. Like we see somebody's post or we get their Christmas card and it's just, everybody's just so perfect. And, and you're like, oh, their life must just be so perfect right now. And oh, how mine isn't. And, and then we do that even when we meet people like, did you ever have that one bad experience with a, a teacher in school and then you wrote him or her off for the rest of your career? Because that one encounter. But y'all know that we can't judge people by some Instagram photos or by just even a one encounter with them because what's missing from that is real connection. And if you sit down with anybody and you begin to hear their story and to know their story, there's this connection that is made and, and it blesses your life. But then some of us come into a season like Advent where there's going to be lots of opportunities for connection. There's extra events. There's these holidays that we have to gather with family and friends and yet we come in and we are weary the last thing we wanna to have to do is connect with more people. And so we will hold that out here. We will hold that out here because we, we don't really know quite what to do with all that we are holding here with our weariness of this wars and, and the ec ec economic suffering and, and just being a mom of teenagers, just finals. It's just, you're holding this. And so, wait, we're, we know that we need to have this connection time. And so what are we to do with this? What I want y'all to know is that 2,000 years ago, people were even more weary than we were. And it is into that exact moment that God came in the form of a baby and gave us new words, words of hope and peace, of joy and love. And so that's what we're doing this Advent. Your weariness is welcome here. But right alongside that, we are going to discover the other gifts of Advent. And this morning, we're going to look at two other Advent characters, both weary in their own situations. Elizabeth and Mary found themselves in situations beyond they could ask or imagine. And we're going to see what they do in the midst of that time. One of the things I want you to know is that in 1943, Y'all have heard of this guy, Maslow, and he, he came up with this thing called the hierarchy of needs. I'm going to show you what it is. And, and hit, hit, at the very bottom, he said, we have these physiological needs, which is food, water, warmth. You need clothes on your body, and then you move up, and it's safety. And then third is belongingness and love. But what we have discovered since 1943 in thousands of research studies is that he got it wrong because we know that babies that are fed and have a safe place to live and also ones that have clothing on their back and they get their diapers changed if they do not experience human connection if they do not experience human touch they do not thrive and so yes the, the base need it is physiological but it's also emotional and mental and psychological and spiritual, those basic needs are part of our very physiology, the way that God made us. And this connection, we have to hold on to it. So as we prepare to hear God's word, will you pray with me? Gracious and loving God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our heart, may they be pleasing and acceptable to you for you are our rock and our redeemer. We pray this in Christ's name. The, the text that we're going to read today, it's, I like to picture it in three separate scenes. Each of them is different. And I, I picture a different smells and sounds and, and, and 
the setting, everything is totally different. And yet, much like an Instagram post, not one of those scenes tells the whole story. And so I pray that in these three different scenes that you might find a, a place to connect this morning. So here is scene one. After those days, Zacharias, his wife Elizabeth conceived, and for five months, she remained in seclusion. She said, this is what the Lord has done for me in this time when he looked favorably on me and took away the disgrace I have endured among my people. I wonder why Elizabeth hid herself away. She is the one who did the action. And the, and the Greek word there means that she felt the need to retreat. She knew that few women were able to have babies at this age, and so I wonder if she put herself on bed rest and just thought, I'm you know, gonna play it safe. But then a few weeks, she thought, well, if I go out now, are they gonna say something? Are people going to chatter? And then chatter will lead to looks, and looks will lead to gossip, and, and then to stress. And the last thing that Elizabeth wanted was any stress in this pregnancy. Plus, who would understand what she was going through? No one had done what she was doing. It was unnatural. Five months of seclusion, and her husband couldn't speak. No baby showers. No gender reveal cakes or balloon pops. Elizabeth did not have HGTV or a job or friends to distract her from her morning sickness. She did not have Instagram reels to scroll through, trying to find someone else that possibly was going through what she was going through. No, Elizabeth was alone. Scene two. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a town in Galilee called Nazareth to a virgin engaged to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary. He came to her and said, Greetings, favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was much perplexed by his words and pondered what sort of greeting this might be. The angel said to her, do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And now you will conceive in your womb and bear a son and you will name him Jesus. He will be a great and will be called the son of the most high and the Lord God will give to him the throne of his ancestor David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever and of his kingdom there will be no end. Mary said to the angel, how can this be since I am a virgin? The angel said to her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be holy. He will be called Son of God. And now your relative Elizabeth in her old age has also conceived a son and this is the sixth month for her who was said to be barren, for nothing will be impossible with God. Then Mary said, here I am I, the servant of the Lord. Let it be with me according to your word. And then the angel departed from her. So we've got Mary, a young girl somewhere around 13 to 16 years old. That would have been typical in her time to be getting married. And she has just been visited by an angel of the Lord telling her, you are going to become pregnant through the power of the Holy Spirit and oh yeah, it's gonna be God. We read that. When the angel tells Mary, greetings, favored one, the Lord is with you, we read that, that Mary is perplexed. The NIV says greatly troubled. The word used here is the only time it's used in all of scripture. It's a compound word, dia terrasso. Terrasso means to be going around and agitated and dia means through. And so she was literally going around and around in agitation in a whirlwind of anxiety. The emotion that Mary feeling, is feeling is not merely just a little worry. She is troubled to her very core agitated, restless, her calmness of mind has left her completely. But y'all, at this point in the text, all she's been told is this, greetings, favored one. The Lord is with you. 
The thing that she was so agitated, it caused her so much anxiety and perplexed was not that she was pregnant. It was how the angel greeted her, greetings, favored one. She has struggled so much to understand that she is accepted and favored by God. The verb is passive. She did not feel favored. Favor was given to her. You see, Mary is a nobody. She is not in any famous line of matriarchs or patriarchs or priests or kings. She doesn't have a formal education. We can assume that she did not know how to read or write. When she comes on in the gospel story, I have to think that those first listeners to this story thought that it would have been a cameo appearance, that she would come on and then just as quickly, We would never have heard from her again because she was just a means to an end. No wonder Mary is so perplexed when out of nowhere an angel of God shows up and tells her you are favored by God. When we are scared and weary and insecure and anxious, we keep God's peace and love and joy and hope. We like to keep it out at a distance. We say things like, how can this be? I am just. Mary was so alone. Scene three. In those days, Mary set out and went with haste to a Judean town in the hill country where she entered the house of Zechariah and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the child leaped in her womb. And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit and exclaimed with a loud cry, blessed are you among women and blessed is the fruit of your womb. Why has this happened to me that the mother of my Lord comes to me? For as soon as I heard the sound of your greeting, the child in my womb leaped for joy. And blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what was spoken to her by the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. If we were just to set, to read, listen to scene three, we would miss the whole story. It is not just a story about two cousins visiting each other, nor is it a story about two girls who take a pre-baby vacation together. This is a story about two women, their lives missing connection. One woman who literally hid herself away for five months. And another woman overwhelmed with anxiety about her own worthiness that she is suddenly favored and now carries the son of God in her womb. These women are desperate to experience peace and hope, joy and love. And how awesome and courageous of Mary That when she got in that state of agitated restlessness that the scripture says that she ran with haste to the Judean town in the hill country, she knew she did not have to stay in that state of anxiety by herself. How compassionate and gracious of Elizabeth. Can you imagine what her face did when she heard that greeting or that knock at the door? She received her unexpected house guest. Even if she wasn't feeling the best with herself, she received that unexpected house guest with joy. And so friends, I want us to consider this Advent, who can we be for someone else? The story of Mary and Elizabeth is an invitation for all of us, an invitation to connect with people. This is where the gifts of Advent bear their fruit. Are you a Mary? Finding yourself filled with anxiety, kind of a spiraling downward, or, or maybe you're like Mary, you're filled with something new. You have a new idea, you have new dreams, you've got new plans, and you don't wanna wait till the new year, new discoveries. May this be a story to encourage you to run with haste. Go tell somebody. Let them carry that newness or that anxiety with you. Or are you an Elizabeth? Are you in a season where you have not wanted to be around people? Advent sounds awful to you. Whether you are dealing with fear, anxiety, confusion, ridicule, 
Oh, may you receive the connection that other people will offer you. Let others in the door. Listen for the knocks. Not just into your home, but into your heart, because this will be way more than Insta-fantastic. May it be so in my life and in yours. Let us.